Bom, boa noite, pessoal. É, estamos aqui com o professor Julian Cardenas, o João também está aqui hoje. A gente teve um pequeno probleminha de internet. É, o professor teve que ir para uma sala de aula, onde a conexão está um pouco melhor, para poder apresentar aqui a aula dele. Mas chegamos, estamos aqui muito felizes. Então, hoje a gente começa o nosso módulo 2 do curso de extensão do ADEP. E a primeira aula vai ser com o professor Julian Cardenas Garcia. O professor Julian é professor pesquisador de Transnational Petroleum Law né? e arbitragem na Universidade de Houston. E vai é, fazer essa apresentação para... para para o LADEP hoje. O professor Julian tem alguns anos que a gente não se vê pessoalmente, da última vez que ele veio no Rio de Janeiro. A gente, a gente se encontrou na UERJ e eu estou muito feliz de receber ele aqui hoje. Professor Julian, muito obrigada e fica à vontade para fazer sua apresentação. Professor Julian, eu just presented you to the class So, I'm very happy and very glad that you accept our invitation to be here with us today in this uh, presentation. And I was talking to them that it's been a while since we met in Rio about some years ago. And um, I hope you enjoy the class. And please, you have about an hour for your presentation. And I will be here in the backstage, me and João Pedro, ok? Muito obrigado, Carolina. É, uh, muito obrigado a todo mundo, a todos, por, uh, for the invitation uh, to this event. Uh, yes, as Professor Carolina Sobredo mentioned, we met uh, many years ago in Rio de Janeiro. And for me, it's a pleasure to uh, have this opportunity to share with all of you uh, part of the work that we do here in Houston, uh, from the University of Houston, and particularly from the School of Law and the Center for Energy, uh, Environment, and Natural Resources, uh, where we work on uh, investment law and energy projects that uh, in, in different regions of the world, in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe, of course. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and, uh, and to share with this invitation since uh, the topic of today is one of the subjects that we discussed here in the class that deal with uh, the study of power and the study of the law, uh, particularly the law that applies for petroleum and gas transactions. Um, so the purpose of this class is that uh, it turns to be a, a regular class in the spring semester uh, of the University of Houston Law Center, Diplomacy and Geopolitics of Oil and Gas, aimed to discuss the interaction between power and the law, uh, understanding the law as a translation of power uh, in the reflection of the balance of power between industry actors. Industry actors that we have uh, in the oil industry from different nations. Uh, different nations that will, will be in the form of nation states, but that can be also in the form of transnational corporations, individuals, and non-governmental organizations, international markets. So, uh, I prepared uh, a presentation in order to introduce my school. Uh, this will be the interaction. It is part of the background that we use in the methodology of our class. Huh? We are in the, studying the intersection of power, the power, the balance of power of these uh, actors in the oil industry, and then the law that is created and is a translation of this power uh, on different rules that you may be all aware of contracts, treaties, national law that deals with hydrocarbons. So a little bit of background, yes, uh, we are located uh, in Houston, 
Houston is well known uh, as the energy capital of the world. Uh, it's the base of the headquarters of many or all major transnational oil and gas company in the world, and of course, energy company as well on the renewable sector. Uh, uh, from Houston, Texas, uh, where, where the same where it's located, is the major oil producer uh, of oil in the United States with a production at its peak in recent years, just before the COVID pandemic uh, scenario. It was producing close to 4 million of barrels of oil a day, uh, which by itself could place who plays uh, Texas as one of the top oil producers in the world. So this is the city, a picture of the city, of the downtown of the city. Um, we, have, we are very close to downtown. Very soon we will get this new building. I hope Carolina, a student from the uh, uh, you know, faculty and student from the University, uh, Federal University of Rio de can visit us when we get this new building by uh, uh, the end of next year. Uh, so as you can see here, we are very close to downtown, downtown Houston. We are the center that covers or has a curriculum with the uh, biggest number of oil and gas law courses uh, in the nation. And, uh, and we also focus not only on oil and gas, but energy courses given the uh, energy transition that we're going through. One of the purposes of uh, the class on globalization, uh, diplomacy of oil and gas, and studying this intersection of the power and law, is that uh, we ask our students here in Houston uh, to have a vision. What is the vision that they have of the world? Uh, because depending on the vision they have of the world, that also that vision will translate, will have a consequence in the law that they practice or how they see a law that they practice. Uh, this is not a reference to that if the world is round or it is flat, but it's a reference that if you see a world that is globalized or a world that when we in the Western hemisphere we work, in Asia people are sleeping or whether when they go to work we go to bed in this side of the world. Well, that type of world, uh, the, the, the idea of the round world, uh, it's not it's not longer a reality in many of the age. Huh? We live in a more hyper connected world, a uh, world in, in a more um, a world that uh, production is delocalized, uh, capital flies from countries to countries looking for opportunities of investment. So we work in a global economy where people are not sleeping while, while the others are going to work. Uh, we live in a world that uh, is going uh, very fast every day. Yeah, people are going, uh, are competing uh, for markets every day and, and every minute. Huh? You can see uh, that, for example, in the difference that we have these days on how capital markets work, financial markets, Monday to Friday, they have uh, hours, they have uh, uh, the, the weekends, uh, whereas you have the cryptocurrency market, for example, that is open 24-7 huh? every day. Huh? If, you, if you follow what is going on with a crypto market. Huh? So there's more visions of the world around flat or... Um, uh, by the way, in, in terms of economic view, huh? we're not talking here about uh, your physics or, your physics or uh, geography or physics. Uh, so, why is relevant um, how you see the world? Because uh, in your vision of the world would be then translated the law that, that you practice. In terms of the old market, uh, uh, there's a, 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 a formula that we use to understand what is the type of local oil and gas market that we see today. Huh? The oil and market is that different today that uh, uh, the United States became two years ago the number one producer of oil in the world, something that didn't happen since the 1970s. Uh, today we have Brazil as the major, the biggest, the, the country that produced more oil in Latin America, thing that I think that was unthinkable 20 years ago when Mexico and Venezuela were at their top of their production over producing over 3 million of barrels of oil. So imagine today how that changed, how Venezuela collapsed, how Mexico also had a major decline in their production 
close to 50% of what they used to produce, and Venezuela is producing 10% of what they used to produce in the past, and you have Brazil with a, 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 steady, a steady trend going up huh, for producing more oil, uh, close to the three million of barrels of oil a day, probably less because of the pandemic. So how do we see the market? So we see the market, a market that's globalized, that is hyper connected, and uh, in a world that is more interdependent. The evolution of extractive technologies has shown that there is more oil than we estimated. We can produce more than we calculated. And we will consume less than we expect. Therefore, these changes affect the balance of power among industry actors and are impacting, impacting the legal practice in the oil sector. Uh, imagine that the world at the beginning of the 20th century where only a few nations in the world concentrated most of their reserves of oil in the world. Uh, only a few countries have. Today, Mozambique, Uganda, Guyana in South America are calling the attention of investors in the oil sector. Countries that were unthinkable to be a major player in international oil and gas industry. Again, the example that I just mentioned about Brazil, how Brazil in 20 years made a completely change in, uh, in the panorama, in the business environment of the oil industry uh, in South America. So again, the, in the equation you have a different a global economy, a global economy that is hard to connected and interdependent. Uh, no country today can solve the, the problems that are has a global scale, and immigration, climate change, energy security. It's not only the control of a state by itself. It needs the cooperation of other states. Uh, uh, the extractive technologies, new extractive te technologies, I'm sure you have heard about hydraulic fracture, how new access to new oil, oil reserves that were uh, unthinkable to be or not economically feasible to be produced in the past are today, based on the new technology, are available as proven reserves, as reserves that are accessible for, for production. So the evolution of technology created also that advantage that today there is more access to higher carbon resources. Not only access in the, in the face of exploration, but also access that more oil we can produce based on these technologies. And the sophisticated offshore platform that you see uh, in Prensal in Brazil, that, that is a technology that didn't exist 50 or 60 years ago and has improved over time and have made more economically uh, feasible and uh, it has been more available to, nation, to nations to get access to um, uh, these uh, offshore platforms. Um, so we can produce more. Uh, so there is an abundance of resources that are available in the hydrocarbon sector uh, and, and based on the concerns that we have in climate change, based on the improvements of other technologies that are competing in some uh, sectors of the market, of the energy market with the hydrocarbon production and with oil, so we may consume less. Huh? Our forecast of consumption uh, it's not as uh, oil dependent as it used to be in the past. Huh? Uh, so all these equations have a consequence on the bargaining power, huh? on the power of negotiation that a nation may have. Uh, when when uh, uh, the oil producer nation, nation with reserves, were scarce, huh? not that many, they were they were in a better position to negotiate terms. Once that resource is abundant, once there are more players uh, out of the market that uh, participate in the market that compete in the attraction of investment, then the bargaining power of those players start to be need to be more flexible if they uh, intend to attract investment or the development of their natural resources. So that is part of the idea of power. So how how is the world that we see today? So we're in a world where um, the biggest uh, economies in the world are uh, uh, located in, in North America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, 
Uh, so uh, if we go to a list of the top economies in the world, the top 10 economies in the world, as you can see, so you have the United States as the biggest uh, gross domestic product, uh, so in terms of the size of the economy, with 22 trillions of dollars um, a year. Then China is second with 16 trillions. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the slide, how big is this, the, the difference with the third and the fourth position nations that are the least? Huh? Japan, 5 trillion. Germany, 4.3. Huh? And then the UK, India, France, Italy. Huh? So you can take from this slide where capital for investment, where companies are located that participate in these markets are the economy that have abundant resources, technology and capital that are able to uh, export this technology for to an investor. If we take this uh, chart in terms of in terms of um, uh, nation, you can see a, a broad chart. You have Brazil is here. Huh? It's the first country from uh, Latin America that appears in the list with a GDP estimated on. 1.4, but uh, Brazil has been close to the 2 trillions also uh, in terms of GDP. Uh, so in the size of the economy, Brazil for sure is not only the country with more population, but also with the uh, biggest uh, economy in the list. And you can see Mexico as the, uh, as the second nation uh, in, in the list. So when you see the, this slide, one of the things that you also uh, and you can compare, recently I was reading a statistic from the International Chamber of Commerce that are Brazil and Mexico, the countries leading Latin American arbitration practice. And it's not a coincidence. It's a coincidence that are the country with most of the trade, most of the traction of investment, and, uh, and are a country that are leading this practice. In terms of how we study the oil and gas industry, in terms of history and globally, so um, we uh, can uh, differentiate different periods of time. Huh? Period of time because the oil market, without a regulator, without the intervention of uh, these actors, uh, states, international organizations, cartels like OPEC, organization of oil producing states or producing countries uh, and exporting countries. Uh, uh, we will have a market with a boom and bust cycle uh, very frequently. Yeah? The price go up with a, in a bomb. In a bomb, then um, certain events happen. Then they invade the market with uh, pro, uh, uh, with production. And then there is a collapse uh, of of the price, and then the the, the resources are pulled down. And then another situation may happen for scarcity, and then the price uh, recovers and, and goes on. Yeah? So, but the market had been introduced in the Rockefeller era with the Standard Oil. Uh, it was the first exercise of intervening the market by uh, uh, Rockefeller and the Standard Oil. This was the era of the early 20th century. Uh, but then it was a text of the Rock Commission, and actually the Oklahoma uh, uh, regulator that um, incorporated quotas in the production of oil in the United States that at the time uh, was uh, a prevalent market for imposing global price and index of price. Then, of course, uh, we have the period of the, uh, the also known seven systems, uh, the companies that also uh, intervene in uh, agreeing on uh, areas of production in the world, as it was the uh, Red Line Agreement. Uh, in 1928, that distributed the access to oil reserves in the Middle East, uh, particularly the, the, uh, in Iran, uh, and and that type of consensus or agreement among industry actors at the time permitted and control of quotas at the time permitted not only the seven system but the Texas Red Rock Commission to have a control of the market. And you can see here in this slide how the price was controlled at the time. Uh, these were prices of oil that were among one, two dollars a barrel of oil uh, that existed at the time. Of course, it's not the same value of one dollar today. This is, you have to uh, connect the value of that with inflation. So as you can see here, 
according to uh, 2009 prices, it was $10, it was uh, over $20, the, the average price at the time, uh, according to you know inflation. Uh, but then you have when OPEC took control of uh, the quarters, uh, when uh, 13 producers, or oh, at the time were less of them, Venezuela and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, and, um, countries in the Middle East agreed to create an organization of uh, producing and uh, exporting countries, uh, all producing and exporting countries. And uh, then OPEC started imposing, uh, well, the, the genesis of that, or the, the creation of OPEC, they added embargo to the United States that. Uh, as a consequence of the support of the United States to the Yom Kippur War uh, between uh, uh, Egypt and Israel, uh, provides provides a crisis that then make the prices skyrocket or create a boom of prices and make the countries in the Middle East uh, agree with Venezuela to create this cartel in order to control production and to manage the weapon of supply. So when these countries require more resources, they cut their production, price goes up, and they get access to more of the capital uh, resources that they can attract. You may also have in mind that most of these countries, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, were countries that rely Iraq, were countries that rely a lot in their national budget on uh, oil and gas resources, are not diversified economies uh, like any uh, other you know major economy in the world is. Of course, they, uh, in the past, some events in the Middle East, such as the Iranian Revolution, created also a scarcity of access of oil uh, at the peak, the jump, the boom of these prices that are compared to the prices that we had in the first decade of the uh, 20th century. So uh, the intervention of OPEC was uh, created some volatility. As you can see, the OPEC era is not compared as uh, with the uh, Texas Trade Road Commission era, uh, in terms of the stability in the price, uh, we have more volatility in the in, in the hands of OPEC, and that but that control lose uh, uh, strength uh, with the pass of time, since OPEC is no longer that major that cartel that produces most of the oil. OPEC by itself. Uh, reached to have a 30% of the quota of the production of oil that we have these days. Huh? Uh, and then this is why you may see in the news that OPEC is not acting alone, but acting associated with Russia, sometimes with Mexico, and they invite other countries also to participate as observers in OPEC meetings in order also to participate uh, in these meetings. There you go, here you have the index of volatility that we have in the different eras. Huh? The uh, Rockefeller era, 51% uh, volatility. Rockefeller era, we understand it was 24%. Boom and bust cycle uh, in the uh, beginning of the 19th century. Then you have the Texas era, only 4% volatility. Uh, how the Texas Railroad Commission uh, achieved to have a, a control of oil prices. Uh, until the 1973, that they stopped, decided to stop intervening in the market, and then it was OPEC, the organization controlling the the price of oil with a volatility of 24 percent in times where they leave certain booms and certain busts of the price of oil. Okay, uh, here's a, a show on also how uh, the price of oil, uh, you know, goes through or suffers the consequence of the great recession of the financial crisis in the U.S. in 28, 29. I mean, it's a global, it, it, it ended being a global recession, economic recession that affected prices. Uh, then uh, we had a, a recovery of the price uh, and, but it, it was in the, in the number of the hundreds, it was the peak of 144 that existed in 2008, and then we have the collapse. Also, you may, you may have in mind that this wave that we have, this boom that we have here, 
Uh, he was the boom also created at the moment where the United States have a devaluation of the US dollar. So if you tie a very low fall with the currency of the United States and this currency suffer for inflation or devaluation, so it will lose value, uh, uh, real value, not nominal value, but real value. So you can expect that oil will also take an increase in the price as a consequence of the devaluation of the U.S. dollar. Uh, this was the moment also when the United States decided to uh, invade uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, so they had the war not only in Iraq, but the previous war that they started the, the, with the invasion and the authorization to intervene in Afghanistan by the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, so you have here this era, then you have at this time of this period, the second decade of the uh, 2000, it was a time where hydraulic fracturing was developing here in the United States. Um, and you can see how the market was less step-by-step uh, uh, step being taken by U.S. oil production. And then you can see how oil prices declined because of that abundance of resources. How OPEC tried to intervene the market without Major success, I mean, they, they, the success that may be with the uh, steady prices that we have had uh, of 60, 50, 70 dollars in that range, which also implies a lot of volatility, a uh, margin between 40 to 70, but then you have the collapse of the, uh, the non foreseeable event of that global pandemic that made uh, prices crash, uh, even in uh, April 20, uh, 2012, uh, 2020, here in Texas, we had negative prices of minus $37 a barrel of oil. So practically, it, it didn't happen that way, but practically people were paying $30, so you can take out of them uh, uh, barrels of oil. Huh? Of course, it didn't, it didn't happen that way, but it was a story that they uh, here in the United States, that the WTI was minus 34, minus 37 uh, last year. Uh, so all price volatility uh, in, in this time. So yes, we have a record now, uh, more data to analyze this boom and bust cycle. Uh, OPEC is still relevant as a cartel, but again, it, it's not acting alone. It's acting with uh, partners such as Russia, he says. It's not new, also it happened in the 1980s, but it's a new era of uh, relation between OPEC and uh, Russia. Reducing impacts on Middle East geopolitics and oil prices. So again, we have seen, uh, even the start from 2016, how the uh, conflicts in the Middle East, how the uh, pirates attacks or terrorist attacks or uh, uh, armed attacks in the, uh, Stretcher moves in uh, armed conflicts in that region of the world is no longer creating an impact in the price. Huh? That peak, that boom that you have with the Iranian Revolution, we don't have anymore that type of circumstance. The collapse of the Venezuela oil production has not caused a boom in the price of oil huh? because of the abundance of resources uh, as a consequence of the technology that we have today. Uh, so, uh, so the reduced impact of you know, Middle East geopolitics, oversupply, increased impacts of prime wars among all producing nations, uh, where, where you have no agreement between the Saudis and, and Russian partners in, in, in OPEC, you can see how uh, Saudis decide to go to food production and then how they make the price to collapse from uh, almost 50 to 20 dollars a barrel. Uh, the demand collapse caused by COVID-19 uh, and uh, the global pandemic, of course, we have uh, in the market that we have today uh, that new reality. Uh, uh, we are still forecasting how much of that demand that exists in 2019 can be recovered uh, in the upcoming years. Um, Recalibration of the whole market course, and the, uh, through supply costs between international companies and OPEC plus, so OPEC and other partners. Recovery of the uh, stabilization of prices, uh, and well, we have to try to make predictions about what will happen in the future. 
So, uh, in terms of the projections and forecasts that we may have, this is International Energy Agency showing how uh, the projections of consumption of uh, uh, hydrocarbon all products, all demand by product can be forecast for the next uh, five years. And, and as you can see, the demand is going up, even from this report from 2021. Uh, and, but it's in the range that it was existing in the past. So the world used 100 or almost 100 of barrels of oil a day. That's the market that we have. It went down uh, during the global pandemic, but it's in the path to recover that, that production. So, so oil is not going out, oil, oil, is not, oil is not going anywhere just because of the pandemic or just as a consequence of uh, the energy transition. It's still, there's a market for uh, oil investment. And, and we see because the demand of oil investment that will rely on the energy consumption for economic growth of different uh, countries uh, will still is still continuing the needs of these economies the consumption of fuel or oil uh, refined products. Huh? So as you can see here, global oil demand rebounds from nine-year low of. 91 million of oil a day in 2020 to uh, 104 million of oil a day in 2026. So it will be almost 1 million of oil a, a day added every year if economic growth continues the path that is set for today. But another uh, uh, market that you may be looking at to uh, follow what is going on in the energy market and how the oil industry is moving is checking the uh, investment capital that exists on different sources of energy. So this is also a chart that I took from the International Energy Agency for the report of 2021. So you can see here the uh, different uh, columns of investment that exists in the oil and gas sector that it covers the blue uh, uh, these, these two uh, uh, columns here. Then you have coal uh, in green. Then you have low carbon, carbon fuels, renewables, fossil fuel power, nuclear, and electricity networks. So if you take all upstream exploration and production and then development, mean that downstream, if you can add these two, uh, if you can take it separate, it seems like it's similar to renewable energy, but actually it kind of double uh, renewable energy uh, investment. Huh? So it's still the investments, the prevailing investments in the energy sector today are allocated in the hydrocarbon industry. Still, as for today, huh? most of the investment that exists for energy production in the world are connected. I mean, the sector that concentrates most of the investment is the oil and gas sector. Of course, this trend is happening at a decline, as you can see. Of course, this trend is not only affected by the energy transition, but it's also affected by the recent uh, global economic contraction as a consequence of the global pandemic. But it is relevant for sure that investments in the renewable sector are increasing and are getting more traction and are getting more government support huh, in terms of meet, uh, meet the uh, the uh, a, a reduction of emissions uh, for um, uh, the United Nations, uh, the Paris Agreement, or uh, the goals that states are making for 2050 uh, in terms of reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions or uh, reaching the net zero emission uh, goals that they may that they may have, uh, having electric cars in, in cities, having using nations. Uh, that rely on the electric vehicles. Huh? But those electric vehicles are producing their electricity from many different sources. It can come from gas, it can come from uh, 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 renewable, solar, wind, uh, but it can come also from fuel and hydrocarbon sources. 
So uh, here you have the um, what was the trend at the time, just before the global pandemic. So as you can see, world production was in an over uh, supply with regard to a consumption in, in 2018. Then how OPEC intervened, trying to cut, doing cuts and trying to balance the production and consumption. And then you can see here what was the decline uh, by the uh, March, April uh, 2020 with the global pandemic, how the world just collapsed. It, it, it deleted like 15 millions of oil of oil a day in consumption when, when you have all the airplanes uh, on the ground. Uh, you stop international flights, stop uh, 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 travel uh, for people in different uh, countries. Uh. So uh, there are different scenarios of the recovery. You will see, you may consider what are yours. Uh. Um, so we can go in, in different directions. Uh, this is a, a chart from IHS, uh, an international consulting firm doing the economics of, of these uh, scenarios. So, uh, all the scenarios focus on the decline of investment that may exist. This is already a reality. This data has been confirmed in, in this year, uh, in 2021, uh, by the United Nations Commission of uh, Trade and Development, the UNTA. Then you have uh, how also in the United States production, it's not only opaque that cut production, but uh, private actors in the U.S. also cut production to face the uh, contraction in the consumption of oil uh, uh, internationally. Uh, how this would, the OPEC, this is a graphic that you can chart that shows how OPEC decide to approve cuts uh, and continue, they continue negotiating those cuts to maintain the prices that are not, are prices that are allowing the industry to uh, continue operating. Then, uh, in, in terms of the energy transition, we, as you can see here, all projections recognize a role for oil, uh, as well as gas and coal. And then, of course, renewables will increase in their uh, quota of the market. But we are transitioning not to a just 100% full renewable energy, but a mix, uh, an scenario where renewable production of energy will be uh, more available, will increase, but not getting rid of the uh, use of hydrocarbons. Huh? So a question that you may ask is, okay, well, what is the world that you see right now? A world that is fully controlled by OPEC, uh, a world that is controlled by OPEC and other actors, or we're living in a world that OPEC is no longer uh, a major actor in the industry, huh? probably the last a scenario is, a, is an extreme of that. It's, it is still a major actor, but it's that, it does not have the control that it used to have in the past. You, you as, as I mentioned, Brazil being uh, uh, a major producer, not, not a major exporter, but a major producer of oil in, in Latin America, uh, manage its energy resources and energy security plans uh, in an independent way, uh, not, not being a member of, of this cartel. So um, these are the confirmation of the stats uh, of contraction in the investment. But, but this refers to global, not only to oil. So we, we will go through a year of contraction, of reduction of investment, in international investment in, in economies. Uh, so the question will be how this translates to the law. How this translates to the law that govern oil and gas transactions. So, um, this, in, in this situation, some countries may go follow trends or liberalization of the market. So that means that with less capital being invested, uh, our nations are able to develop their own resources with their own money, technology, and know-how and people. So we will see how countries will approach this. How countries will say, in this scenario post-COVID, I will call for more big drafts, I will need more investment, I will need more access to technology, and I will call more investors to come and invest in my country, or I will decide just to close the borders, keep the locks down, and, uh, and I will not attract investment for the development of the resources.
So this rule of issues, again, as you can see, uh, involve the actions of nation states, interstate organizations such as OPEC or the United Nations, international courts and tribunals, that can be international court of justice, but also international arbitration tribunals or arbitration centers. Other actors are non-governmental organizations, international chamber of commerce, why not? Individuals, corporations, and uh, international criminal organizations in some cases, uh, or uh, particularly in the case of the hydrocarbon industry with groups, armed groups that have a consequence or uh, an effect uh, in, in, the, in, in the actions of the industry. Uh, all these actors create law that governs uh, the, the oil and gas industry, uh, and this law is applied globally. So in international treaties, all these relations create international treaties, international agreements, international conventions, contracts, international contracts, law and regulation, industry standard, customer international law that is applicable to the oil and gas industry, arbitration awards, and even judicial decisions. A reflection of that is the increment of bilateral investment treaties or investment treaties that govern um, investment transactions in all sectors of the energy pool that, that we saw. So all investment in renewables, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, nuclear, um, are today, that are, that are agreed in investment contracts, may have the support of investment treaties. Huh? Investment treaties are also include the application of international law and international arbitration. I know that in the case of Brazil, Brazil has decided not to join uh, the investment system in terms of international treaties or being a member of the Washington Convention of 1965 that created the uh, International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes at the World Bank. However, Brazil is not isolated. Brazil is a member of the New York Convention of 1958 for the formal and recognition of uh, recognition and enforcement of arbitration awards, uh, and therefore uh, is connected. And, uh, and by the way, uh, recognized by the statistics of the International Chamber of Commerce, being one of the leading countries in arbitration, international arbitration practice. So not only that, these arbitration cases only in the sense of investment. Uh, as you can see here, there's a boom of these cases, more than 1,000 of these cases recently reported by the United Nations, by the UNCAC. Uh, and as you can see, these treaties and this law, uh, this case law from arbitration is creating also law that applies for the oil and gas industry. As you can see in this map also, you can see how the blue nations are nations that are members of the uh, Washington Convention. You can see that it's a vast majority of nations in the world that have integrated the system. And, uh, and the New York Convention is even uh, bigger than the number of nations that participate in that. Of course, because this convention not only is relevant for investment contracts in the energy sector, but also for commercials and trade. Huh? So it covers broader the impact of the New York Convention if we compare with the Washington. So here in Houston, where we see uh, a, 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 a transaction that is in this environment, this global environment, uh, we see, uh, in, in, particularly in the oil and gas industry, how uh, contracts are connected, right? Uh, how a uh, host government contract, like a contract that is signed by the uh, uh, National Petroleum Agency in Brazil, uh, between the uh, AMP and international investors, how these contracts are submitted to arbitration. Uh, I, all these contracts in Brazil has an arbitration clause. How these contracts also created a joint operating agreement uh, can create uh, the performance of the obligations in the host government contract, the concession contract, or the production sharing contract in Brazil, uh, can create a joint operating agreement that also has an arbitration clause uh, among the uh, operators, uh, the investors in that contract. How this JOA translates also to service contracts to engage in the activities, the production, like production of production activities, uh, and has an arbitration clause, and how many of the procurement contracts to provide the goods necessary for the performance of these activities uh, also include an arbitration clause. So arbitration is all over the place in the oil and gas industry, and therefore it's very likely that international law will govern this contract. 
Another vision that we have from Houston is where we see a petroleum investment. We see that a petroleum investment or petroleum activity in this industry is connected to a national law, legal order, so a national order that uh, you will refer to the uh, compliance with national law, labor law, environmental law. Uh, it may comply with uh, 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 practices recognized at the national level. It may also be, be connected with international law in terms of many uh, investment in the oil and gas, uh, issues related with investment in the oil and gas and in the arbitra international courts of justice, such as the European Court of Justice or the Inter-American Court of Justice, has cases that deal with uh, oil and gas investment, so, 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 such as the Sarajaki case against Ecuador. Uh, uh, with regard to a control uh, investment of the company Occidental that engaged in a, in, a, in a contract in which Ecuador failed to provide a higher percent uh, with a local community house, this uh, indigenous community presented a claim against the state of Ecuador in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Costa Rica and also uh, petroleum investment can connect with arbitration not only at the level of investor state arbitration, but also at the level of uh, intercompany uh, arbitration. So uh, arbitration practice in the oil industry has become more abundant, it's more common practice, and more publicly available arbitration awards. Are more, uh, there's more access to these arbitration awards, and therefore um, uh, there's the study of these arbitration awards to create new doct legal doctrine, new practices in the industry, and uh, if pro they provide a view uh, of what is happening in the protection of rights of investors in, term, in terms of cases, what happens when an expropriation or a, national, a nationalization takes place, and therefore how investors can receive some revenue from those actions of, of, of a nation state, uh, having in mind that uh, uh, that uh, they are investing in a market that comprises long-term investment, long-term contracts, uh, contracts that last for more than two decades to be performed, and how political changes that may exist in one nation can affect the performance or the rights of investors in these contracts. So at this point, I, I will stop for uh, any question that you may have. Uh, with this, we cover the interconnectivity of uh, power and, and the law that is created in the oil and gas industry and that law that is applied globally these days as global are the problems of the oil and gas market. So you have here on the screen my email or my clear uh, uh, link so you can uh, get in contact in case you have any questions. So Carolina, I think at this point I get back to you to see if uh, there, there are some questions. Um, hi, William. I uh, we we heard you perfectly at the classroom. I was uh, enjoying very much your presentation. I was remembering my own research. I bet that Juan also remembered some uh, class that we have in Rio about uh, uh, foreign investments for investment law and international oil oil contracts and how these uh, I, I really like this slide that you put that has all those actors like companies host governments uh, uh, arbitration awards all of those uh, uh, suggesting that it's it's law it's how the world is being regulated now and I also liked this slide talking about how oil is going to grow until 2029 uh, uh, actually the the big companies that there is one slide that you mentioned that the big companies are of course, changing, investing more in renewables, but the investment will be also in oil and gas uh, 
even though we have this this movement in Europe uh, to force, of course, globally, everybody to change and abandon the oil and gas. But for countries like Brazil and, for, for example, Venezuela, that will be a waste waste of uh, resources. We have a lot of oil to take it out in Brazil. So we have to observe. And I, I remember that I, heard, I read something uh, like three years ago and about this, uh, this time, the projection in time that we are going to use oil and looks like the same now. So that doesn't change. Um, uh, that's that's uh, more of my view. Uh, I don't I don't have actually a question, but I don't know if uh, João has a question. Yeah, actually, I, I have a question. I have also uh, a subject here for us to discuss. Uh, but first of all, I, I would like to to thank uh, Professor Cardenas. Uh, for accepting our invitation and for this outstanding lecture. Uh, I am a huge enthusiast of this subject and uh, I have a question uh, actually uh, about a, a more um, uh, macro point of view. Uh, we are seeing a global push, especially from Europe, towards a, a, a more expressive use of renewable energies. Uh, and the, uh, we have a a discussion about the carbonization. Uh, we have environmental factors doing part of private companies' concerns. Uh, we have a commitment of several countries uh, with multilateral instruments that aim to fight against climate change, uh, such as the Paris Agreement, the, the Sustainable Development Agenda of the UN. Uh, all of these certainly uh, have an impact not only in the, the energy-related policies of national states, but also the investments in these infrastructure projects. Uh, we also have, Professor Cardenas, a, a geopolitical component here. Uh, we're seeing, for example, China investing hugely in renewable energy. Uh, we saw recently uh, a friction between the US and Europe because of uh, Angela Merkel's support of a gas pipe between Germany and Russia. Uh, I agree with you and Carolina uh, when you, you both say that oil and gas are still going to retain a re relevant market share in the future. But I would like to hear more about the role of oil and gas on a geopolitical perspective. Uh, do you think this trend will develop in, in such way that it would change the global energy scenario? That's the first question. Uh, a, a second one is about uh, this uh, this trans, uh, transnational law scenario. Uh, this, uh, this trend also uh, developing in such a way that it's, uh, it's expected for, 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 uh, for Europe uh, and the most. Uh, the trans, transnational law scenario uh, also, uh, also has a, a trend to change as well. Yeah, can I? Can I? Yes, you can. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Carolina and you all. Wow, what a thoughtful comment and what a thoughtful question. So I, I completely agree. So let me start with you uh, on, on the topics because you touched many different things, right? You you mentioned, for example, uh, all the debate that exists with the uh, the second line of the Nord Stream uh, uh, pipeline. The Nord Stream pipeline uh, between Russia and landing in Germany, right? And how that affects Ukraine position. Uh, that Ukraine used to be the transit of gas of Russia to Europe. Uh, and how that Nord Stream uh, pipeline is providing uh, for Gazprom and, and Russia uh, more power uh, for Russia and probably more dependency of Western Europe for gas. Whereas the United States tried to develop uh, LNG gas and try to sell uh, LNG and the development of a global market for LNG. Huh? Imagine that LNG one day can turn to be like oil. 
No, you're very challenging, but that can be a, a, a project for the next decade. Huh? Something that uh, can nations be, be, or the United States have been working on. So, of course, your politics and your question about is, I took your question out. How oil and gas your politics are relevant where we are, we have an energy mix that is bigger than all the oil. So, for sure. So, if you see the, this slide, uh, that uh, is uh, it's a projection. It's a, this slide, I think, is three years old, yes. Uh, about three years old. That you see the, the, how the energy mix may be in the future. Uh, how oil, gas, uh, will continue playing a role in economic growth. Huh? So, I feel oil will have an impact, oil and gas will have an impact, not only in uh, energy uh, production, but also in the attraction of investments. So that means that uh, not all nations can develop or not all economies can engage into the energy transition or the renewable energy uh, path uh, faster or the same path than others. When you compare cities in Europe that have uh, density that are very well connected, that public transportation works, that the distance from place to place are not that big, well, translate that urbanism and economic model to Oklahoma or to other states or to Oregon or uh, to uh, North Dakota in the U.S. or to Idaho in the U.S., it will be different. Translate that to other countries in South America, it will be very challenging. Huh? Uh, uh, for example, I will give you one example. Imagine that Mexico, there are poli sorry, Colombia, there are politicians in Colombia arguing that Colombia should go 100% renewables in the next five, ten years. Right? They, they, they are not investing in exploration, therefore they at some point may reach uh, a peak in their access to the uh, hydrocarbon reserve that they have. So they follow the same political narrative that a politician in Costa Rica, that a population in Costa Rica is not even the same population that the capital of Colombia, Bogotá. So it will be easier to get 100% renewable a country like Costa Rica if you take a country with 44 million people in Colombia. Yeah. So I imagine that in Brazil you have cities that two cities in, in Brazil make the whole population of Colombia. So energy transition is not homogeneous. Uh, we won't get the same result uh, of asking or promoting energy transition energy transition all over the place, good things, evolution in technology, good thing, reduction in the cost, I mean, all, all of these things are good for mankind, huh? everybody at some point will take advantage of that, it's like these cell phones, right, these cell phones, only few economies, few people could get access to that, now there are billions of people getting access to this technology, so we will see in this century, all that will be, that will transcend our generation, right? Uh, uh, so, but, but it will be homogeneous. It will take time that you take the same speech of going 100% renewables to all people. It, it won't be that way. And the other factor is, is because not all nations, not all communities are contributing to uh, global warming or climate change at the same path. Take the list of CO2 emissions in the world. You will see what are the countries that contribute the most. Check Venezuela. The contribution of Venezuela on emissions is less than the Netherlands, for example. Or there are, you, you will take different uh, 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 the, the realities of the economy, and it's not homogeneous, it's not the same. So as it's not the same, and because it is diverse, Diversity will also play a role. So at some point, uh, energy renewable diversity will play a role. Even though the problem is global, uh, but the challenging, the challenges in, in China and the U.S. are bigger than many other nations. Uh, this is why, if you ask from Texas, people think about Texas and, and think about oil, but it's not only oil; it's gas. But it's not only oil and gas. Texas is one of the biggest, it's the biggest wind power producer in the United States. 
So there's a massive investment also of renewables here in, in, in Texas. Huh? And if you change the contribution of reduction of CO2 emissions from the United States, you will see that the United States, because of the implementation of new technology, is going even faster than countries that promote this in political speeches. Okay? So you see that uh, the, the uh, entrepreneurship in the United States made that the uh, way to go to uh, renewable technology is it, in a good path. But how many years will need renewables to catch up with oil? Huh? If, if as of today is still oil in downstream and upstream is still capture more than renewable is attracting. Again, renewable is attracting a massive. I can see my students, many of them going to work out to renewable companies, renewable energy companies. Renewable energy production in Mexico was also a boom in the power sector. So all that market is growing. Uh, but we will see. Uh, we will see. Uh, but but it, it's growing, but it's not uh, eliminating. It's not taking out of the market the hydrocarbon industry so far. Uh, as as uh, Carolina was mentioning also, uh, the resources are available in, in Brazil, in Venezuela. At some point, it, I mean, if conditions change in Venezuela for, for better conditions to attract investment, you, you will see investors saying, oh, I, I won't invest in Venezuela because what, what the CEO of Total say, uh, I'm leaving Venezuela because I need to invest in renewables. No, uh, you could invest even in renewables in Venezuela. You are not leaving Venezuela uh, because of uh, that you need to invest in renewables in Europe. Uh, is, there, is there a political situation in Venezuela that makes it difficult? Make that change. Make that change in the politics. And you will have probably a very attractive market to invest. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, if, you, if you allow me to, to add uh, another challenge, we, we had, uh, as you said, as you, you well said, um, uh, the challenges in a developed country uh, are, are, are different from an underdeveloped one. And we had another challenge that uh, a lot of governments are trying to uh, trying to to address, but it's not an easy one. Is about the, the export of pollution by the the, the private sector industries. Uh, uh, for for uh, an instance, uh, we had some companies that uh, there were in, in the U.S. and then it was it became um, expensive to produce in the U.S. So you you go to another area, to, you go to an area that is, um, that is cheaper to produce. And a lot of, I believe, a lot of uh, industries that, that uh, are based in, in, I don't know, coal or other, uh, or other pollution, or other pollution you are going to migrate to these countries these underdeveloped countries that uh, are in, in another uh, level of uh, this discussion of, of uh, an energy transition. Um, and I, uh, I, I believe uh, Carolina also thinks uh, someone uh, uh, about that. And I believe it's, 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 dif it's difficult to, to, to do these homogeneous, as you said, uh, the development towards a, a sustainable development uh, in, in, in all countries at the same time. Yeah, definitely. You know that, uh, let me give you an anecdote. Uh, last, last year, we're in September. I think it was not in April, in April or May this year. I was participating in a competition in Mexico, in a university in Mexico. It was very interesting. So. A group of students from a class uh, presented eight teams creating new projects for investment, uh, energy and development. And uh, I heard all projects, one was nuclear and the rest was all focused on renewable energy. So none of them focused on oil. 
And that caught my attention. Because of course there's a narrative, there's a construction, and there's a trend. We cannot deny that trend. And actually we we should we, we should support that trend. Because if that trend is a consequence of uh, mankind and ingenuity, engineering, technology, of course, if that would provide benefit for for uh, uh, the environment and, and society, we may support these ideas. But the problem is when this narrative tried to deny the other reality. So I said, wow, I heard, I mean, all the people, the students were students between 18 to 21 years old. And I said, okay, I, I can see that you're working for what you believe in your future, that everything will be renewable and all projects will be renewable. But in order to get to 100% renewable, you may invest in oil for many years. Oh, it all will be there. So do not ignore that because if you ignore that as a Mexican student, then at some point all will continue and you will need lawyers with expertise in hydrocarbons law and you will end probably hiring a student from the University of Houston. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, because we, we continue working in that path. We are not, we are not uh, set, uh, creating a, a censoring or hiding oil and gas and just talking about the oil. No, it's a mix. It's a mix. And oil is not going anywhere. We will, we will see the consequences of what the global pandemic will cause in terms of uh, human habits, uh, working in office, uh, traveling, uh, uh, these uh, internet connections, Zoom, uh, and how all of that will, will how will recover our normal practice. How education, I'm now teaching back again in the classroom, but my classes are some students in the classroom and some students online. So the world of in-person education has not been recovered 100% as, as 19, uh, 2019, you see? So we will see also how human hands and how, um, there are forecasts that say we won't recover that uh, habits again. Uh, because we are quite old in these more than 18 months uh, of the pandemic. Uh, but, but again, uh, we will see how, how that goes. Uh, I think my, my concern is when that narrative tries to censor or try to hide the, the other reality. And as you mentioned, it's not the same a developed country that can, the population can say a 30,000 a $30,000 car is a bargain. Here in the U.S., everybody can get a car for $30,000. It's kind of, it's the sweet spot for people buying a car. That's not a sweet spot for somebody in Venezuela, somebody in Colombia, somebody in Mexico. It's different. Okay? So, so reality will be different, and we will see. And, and again, uh, we work on the energy mix, but we work on different sources of energy. And, and as technology and ingenuity and, and better technology is available, available, of course, uh, society may engage on that. The market, the market will also show the solution. Yeah, perfect. I was, I was remember, uh, Julian, that uh, about uh, two thousand and nineteen. I gave some classes at the ANP, the agency, and they were and they were telling me that the cost of pre-salt is about two dollars the barrel. So can you imagine uh, changing all these investments to something that you know it's not uh, uh, it's not that rentable. It's not. Uh, so good commercially. I think, as you said, the market will tell us how it will be uh, how it will be done in the future, in the near, near future. But I see oil and gas, especially in Rio, uh, playing a major role until uh, at least 10 years from now. So that's why, Julian, I am investing a lot of my time and my knowledge to teach the students about oil and gas 
And I also intend to teach a new class about energy, international law. Uh, because I think I, I do too have to move to other energies, especially electricity and work together with the renewables. But you see, I think, I think uh, uh, that uh, the investor will still play uh, a very important role in the oil and gas industry in Brazil and also worldwide. And maybe we are, depending on the technology, uh, move for move towards the renewables but not from now i guess i would like to add something here uh, to professor cardenas uh, that it's it's a big concern of mine actually it was the subject of my of my undergraduate final project and carolina was my my professor advisor that we uh, we have here in brazil uh, uh, a huge, uh, a huge offer of natural gas from pre-South, and we don't have uh, the infrastructure necessary to attend uh, all the country uh, with this natural gas. And uh, we might have, we might have uh, uh, to lose these investments because of the tr energy transition uh, uh, for for twenty thirty, for example. Uh, if we don't have the infrastructure necessary to to use uh, the, this natural gas, we, we might lose the, the the opportunity to to make first to make money uh, to to the state to 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 keep the tax money and to attend the population in, in, in north of Brazil or development Brazil development yes that's it. Sure, and uh, Brazil's already a superpower in terms of hydro. There's a lot of renewable energy in hydro, hydropower. And I, I completely agree with what, what Carolina said. I'm happy to hear that you know you, you're targeting uh, that in, in the next decade because what? Again, take 20 years ago and talk to a Mexican or a Venezuelan and said uh, and said, listen. Uh, in 20 years, Brazil will be the number one producer of oil in Latin America. And Venezuela will laugh about that. And Mexico will say, that's not possible. Where is the oil in Brazil? You have no oil. You cannot produce. We have the, uh, uh, the Faja del Orinoco in Venezuela. That's Venezuela. Uh, Mexico has a uh, major uh, oil reserve. Brazil won't get that. And you see how reality will change. So it takes time, it took two decades. So yes, here things may change over time. But at the, at the data that we have today, we see the trend of the rules taking place. But again, it will take, it may go faster. Huh? These forecasts may change. We may be prepared. But in the near future, in the near future, it's still oil will, because oil will transform. It's kind of, uh, as, as other technologies and energy sources evolve, also, oil in petrochemicals, for example, huh? in petrochemicals. As, as, uh, as uh, we have electric vehicle, also the combustion, combustion engine also evolves in the, and becomes more efficient. So you say today, oh, it's an electric vehicle the only solution. Oh, what about a hybrid? A hybrid, a, a car that can work with gasoline and can go uh, work with uh, electricity, right? And then, you know, the money that you save on, on gas, then at some point where you have to replace that huge battery that you have, so prepare your pockets, right? Because you need to, you will buy a huge, a huge battery. There's another, another narrative that we hear that people talk about renewable energy and they associate that with clean energy, zero emission and all that. Well, guess what? The performance of all the final, uh, market of, of that energy also will require a lot of mining. Mining or developing the materials, the metals, and batteries that are required for this energy. 
do you know any mining that can be considered green mining? Sustainable mining? Maybe in some countries, but not in many countries in Africa or in Latin America. Sustainable mining, that is a challenge. Definitely is a challenge. So, so um, we, we, when we see a Tesla, when we see a car, yes, there's a marvelous evolution of technology. But the, the process of getting that electricity to that car and that battery to that car has a background and uh, a story. Uh, so it may be mining, it may, it may be other sources of energy that, you know, may be as creating as CO2 emissions as other carbon at some point. So again, it will be a balanced business competition. Market will also provide uh, solutions and, and the adoption of society. Society will be adopting technology again, as laptops, as Zoom, as cell phones, and you know, all this revolution that we have seen. Yes, I agree totally. Well, um, if if we don't have any other question, I would like to again say thank you. Uh, for you to this uh, brilliant presentation and saying that I'm very glad that we uh, met again uh, even though we are uh, some miles from distance you are in Houston and we are here in Rio but I I was saying to Professor Owen the other day that at least now we can bring you you <laughs> to us uh, more easy because uh, as you as you can imagine uh, money for research is not so much available now in Brazil so I'm glad that we uh, at least me for me it's uh, totally new to be over the this platform over the internet but it feels like right that I can um, um, how can I say that? Uh, be able to to uh, make it available a lecture like you, like yours, to my students. Uh, so I'm very, very happy, and thank you. And João, if you want to say something. I hope next time working Portuguese because I study a lot of Portuguese in France when I live there and I need to take my Portuguese back. So I hope next time it will be Portuguese. So, uh, was, do, are you going to try to speak in Portuguese? Well, probably next time. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Cardenas, I would like to, to thank you very much for spending time with us uh, today and for giving these, uh, as I said, outstanding presentation, outstanding lecture. I, I hope we can uh, strengthen our ties and, and do it more often. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.